Hello again, everybody. Mark Newstater, and I'm joined today by Councillor Diane Colley Urquhart. Diane, welcome. Thank you for having me today. I'm looking forward to our chat. Great, great, great. Uh, Diane, so the, the format we've been following with, with all the candidates for uh, City Council in Ward 13 is just asking them a few questions. Generally, we're going to ask some questions that have come in from the community. Uh, but first off, uh, you know, we, we know you're our councillor, but maybe give us a little bit of your background, uh, maybe prior to getting into politics or whatever you'd like to talk about there. Yeah, happy to do that. If you don't mind, uh, Mark, um, I just wanted to read the land acknowledgement. And it's important this week, um, on Thursday of this week, will be the uh, National Truth and Reconciliation uh, Awareness Day. And so uh, it's very important to us, uh, Woodlands, Woodbine, and Ward 13, because we border the suit in the nation. So I just wanted to say, um, I wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we are gathered here uh, on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot, and that includes the Bear's Paw, the Chiniki, the Kainai First Nations, and the Pekani Sisiska, and the Stony Nakoda, and of course, the Sutina First Nations and the Wesley First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also uh, the traditional homeland of the historic uh, Northwest Métis and is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So thanks for allowing me to do that. Absolutely, very important, thank you. So let's just talk a little bit about your background, Diane. Uh, I'll, I'll let you speak, but um, you know, maybe maybe tell the the viewers, you know, what not only what prompted you to get into civic politics many years ago, but why you're also running for re-election. Thank you. Um, so I I uh, I'm, was born and raised in Oyen, Alberta, in a farming community, and uh, I often like to talk about my public service because it really started. Uh, you know, uh, living on the farm uh, with different farmers coming together with us, you know, taking off the harvest with us seeding the crop, uh, volunteering and helping out others. And so, uh, you know, I, I take pride in the in my public service role, which has really defined who I am. And so I've had many, many years of volunteerism, uh, 51 years in, as a public service as a registered nurse. And then 21 years uh, in public service uh, as an elected official. So um, all of that combined kind of, uh, you know, indicates that um, I've always had a, a view of my service to others. And so, um, you know, I've learned that along the way. Um, and uh, how did I get in politics? Well, uh, my husband, David, uh, who passed away in 2012, uh, we were together for 40 years. We have a son, Bruce, uh, and um, we moved to Wichita, Kansas in the uh, early 80s, early mid 80s. And uh, we're fortunate enough to work on President Reagan's uh, presidential primary campaign in the state of Kansas. And it's also where I took my nursing degree. So uh, coming back to Calgary then, uh, got involved in provincial politics and uh, worked on uh, Premier Getty's campaign and of course, Ralph Klein's campaign. And then I got involved uh, federally and um, uh, worked with uh, Brian, Mul uh, Brian Mulrooney and was his advance team, part of his advance team. And uh, I was uh, Stephen Harper's president in, in, in uh, the riding of which we all live. And uh, so uh, had the honor of really learning grassroots politics and using my volunteerism uh, to to really get involved in in politics. That's great. And sorry, I have puppies in in the office right now that are uh, running out to greet their mom that just came home. So, um, Diane, what would you say is the number one issue facing the city of Calgary, and how would you address it? We are in some um, really, really challenging times right now, Mark, um, and it's been going on for a while. Uh, we have been in an economic recession since 2015. Um, and so when you looked at the collapse of the oil and gas business and the price of oil dropping basically to nowhere, and that really affecting um, the royalties and the revenues for the province, um, it really, uh, you know, we thought this would be over initially in the first year, the second year, and then it went into the third year. And uh, then we started seeing the implosion of, um, 
of the downtown core. And now we're sitting at about a 30% vacancy rate, which is a real problem for the city of Calgary. Um, and during that time, uh, we, we had to really, really reduce uh, our operating budget. So we cut about a billion dollars out of this operating budget. Uh, because at the city, uh, we need to balance the books every year. Uh, unlike the province, their, their operating, uh, deficit this year will be about 20 billion and their, uh, their collective operating, uh, their debt, uh, will be, uh, over a hundred billion. So this is a big problem. Um, so, so, uh, the downtown core, uh, and, and our economic recovery is really, really important. I think one of the things that really concerned me with all my door knocking and uh, virtual town halls and meeting folks is the risk of inflation now. And I'm hearing from a lot of people that the cost of living is just skyrocketing. Uh, when they go to the store to buy their groceries, um, the cost of utilities, um, and every, every which way they turn, um, things seem to be uh, going up. So. We really, really have to be careful uh, about our finances, which is one of the platforms that votediane.ca is the fiscal responsibility. Um, and, and I think, you know, the other thing that, that really has not served us well during this period of time is market value assessment and how we calculate property tax. Uh, it may have worked in the good old days, but we need to change this provincially uh, because every Every, out of every dollar of taxpayer dollars that, that you and the residents of Woodline would, Woodbine uh, pay, 40 cents of that goes to the province for education, right? And so we're, we're running the city here on a, on a 60 cent dollar, basically. And so uh, we can't increase taxes at a time when we're still in an economic recession. And then on top of all that, you compound this with a 19-month COVID pandemic. And we are in the worst of it right now, this fourth wave. And so, um, you know, one of the reasons I, you know, there were several reasons when I contemplated what I was going to do here. And with my healthcare background and looking at the recovery that we are facing uh, with the long haulers and the impact this has on our economy and people getting jobs and, and trying to make ends meet, um, that we really need people that are experienced at the table, number one, and secondly, that really know how to work with other people and get along to get things done for, for all of you that are listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. So you did address a little bit of, of property tax uh, issues. Um, so I think I'll, I'll skip over that question that I have been asking other candidates. Um, one, one thing that has been brought up to me, and, and certainly as, as a realtor, it's something in my world, is the sprawl of Calgary. Um, it seems like every time I go out for a drive, whether it's to see clients or whatever the case may be, there's a new community popping up. And I'm all for development and for business and all those types of things. How do we balance as a city the sprawl um, versus the the needs to maintain budgets and things like that. Because with these communities, there are still commitments that the city has to make in terms of infrastructure, I would assume, although some of these builders and developers are paying for that. What would your what would your comment be on sprawl and, and the balancing act of it? Uh, the um, so let's talk about Ward 13. So we've got enough land now. Um, that we don't need to uh, be opening up anymore. But this is a really good conversation that I've been having with the community and that when I'm reelected, if I'm reelected, if I can ask for your vote, uh, we need to have a conversation about this. So there are a few issues here. So Providence uh, has 2,300 acres uh, that can be developed. Um, and the area of Sirocco way down south, um, there's another little remnant piece of land. Um, so, so what you get into is, you know, does Calgary do a major annexation so that we can, you know, have some control over what's happening around our boundaries? Uh, because there's a lot of development going around on the fringes around us. We're losing a lot of commercial and warehousing uh, um, uh, capacity that's moving out into the counties and into Rocky View County and Foothills County. And, you know, people are living in Strath Strathmore and Natton and Okotoks and all these other places 
um, and uh, using our infrastructure, but we're not getting the tax base. So mm -hmm. there's that whole conversation about, you know, do we want to broaden our tax base, which I want to do in Providence and Sirocco, which is already within city boundaries, um, or, um, or, or increase taxes, right? And so we have to have growth that pays for itself. And that's what councils worked really, really hard on over the past three years, I'd say, to make developers pay for the front end infrastructure. So that piece is underway. And I'm really, really happy about that. But you've opened the door here, Mark, for me to talk about the community guidebook, okay? Right, and um, that was brought up by, by another candidate as well, and, and the lack of consultation, to be quite honest. Right, so the community guidebook, and I worked with my colleagues to try to defeat this thing because we wanted to have broad community consultation about the guidebook. And so what is this guidebook all about? It's about taking your single family home and allowing administration to work directly with a developer to maybe buy two or three of those houses and maybe put up um, a two or three story uh, higher density area, okay? This is a problem for me. And it is a problem for established communities that I represent. So whether it's woodlands, woodbine, canyon meadows, people brought, bought into these communities um, because they wanted a certain quality of life. They wanted their singer family home. And like my dad used to say when he was still alive, you know, these damn houses are so close together now they can grab your, your, your hamburger right off the barbecue. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we don't want that. We don't want to change the face of these existing communities. So if, if we want to put high density into the core, like Elbow Park and Royal, Mount Royal and all these other places, go for it. You've got most of the infrastructure down there. People want to cycle, they want to walk to work, that's fine. But when it comes to established communities, um, I'm opposed to this. Um, and when you look at the new communities, they are already meeting their high density uh, requirements and thresholds because they're new. They can put in these higher density. They can have mixed use. They can do all these things. And we're doing it in Alpine Park, actually, in Providence, if you folks drive out that way. So we need the votes on council to stop this nonsense. Um, now, I would say that I have supported secondary suites. It took a long time for me to get there. But when I looked at people perhaps your age and my age, Mark, that still want to stay in Woodlands and Woodbine. Um, and many, uh, many seniors are women because women tend to live longer than men. They want to stay in their homes for as long as they can. And they need extra income. And especially now with the recession and the pandemic and the recovery that we're in, people want to stay in their homes and they need the extra revenue. So I'm for secondary suites as long as the neighbors can work together to support that happening. So that's kind of a, a broad brush view of the guidebook and, um, you know, do you go up, out or in? And I would say it's kind of all of the above, but you have to be careful. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, community policing, uh, we have noticed an increase in crime, I would say, in Woodbine and Woodlands, whether that's anecdotal and people posting about things on our Facebook page here, or if it's actually statistically factual, I don't know. Uh, I would say just noticing posts myself personally, and actually my neighbor brought this up to me, Mark, what about community policing? And what is your view on policing in general? And should there be changes made, like inc including more social programming with the police uh, on, those, on those issues? Wow, thank you for that. Um, so on my platform, uh, you'll see you know, the, the, the main pillars, uh, certainly fiscal responsibility. The other one is community uh, safety and security. And so I consulted heavily on my platform with the chief of police and, and the fire department and, and, and Chief Dongworth. And um, so, so police have been underfunded for quite a while. So just to be really clear, I am not in support of defunding the police. Um, this is really important. The police haven't had any growth in their budget uh, for I would say three or four years. And so, as I said in there, we need to hire another 120 police officers. 
Uh, because what has happened over time, as we've been cutting the billion dollars, as I said, out of every budget, police have become more and more reactive and we've lost community-based policing. And Mark Neufeld really uh, understands this. Um, and I told him that I, we had to shut down the community operated police station in Brayside, as you'll recall. And we had thousands of volunteers that were police volunteers that worked with the police for safety and security in our community. We need more cops, more community operated police stations. Um, and, and so that we really get back to community based policing. Um, so I, I, I totally agree with, with people saying that they, you hardly ever see a police officer. No. Nope. Um, when you look at 24 7, 365 and their shifts and all this kind of stuff, and when you look at, um, the increase in organized crime, the increased number of guns on the street, um, the length of investigations, police need more more boots on the street, if you will. Um, okay. the, and so uh, the other thing is, is that AHS has to step up to the plate. And so do the social service agencies. Police want to do policing. They don't want to be social workers. They don't want to be psychologists. Um, and when they get into domestic uh, disputes, for example, uh, you know, when they say, you know, defund the police, take this money away from them. Well, these other orders of government and agencies need to step up and do their job so that police can do the job that they want to do. Okay. All right, let's move on to some more questions from the community. So this one, I had to get a little bit of a grasp on. I did ask, I did phone this person this morning and get some clarity on what this question is. Um, so the question is, why did she not inform Woodbine residents that our $25 million contract with our community and the city was ignored relating to uh, retaining the land along the berm on the ring road. Uh, and the, uh, so I want to make sure I'm capsulizing this correctly. I understand there was some sort of contract between the city and the community to retain a berm and the uh, off leash dog park uh, in the neighborhood of $25 million. I don't understand the correlation of that number. Um, but the question is what, they, their question was, we tried to get through to you, Diane, many times uh, and still don't know what happened. Now our off leash is gone and the walls actually increased the noise. And she said the noise was actually better with just a berm. So I'll just let you respond to that. Yeah. So I don't know the accuracy of the 25 million, but let's go with it. Um, so it would. Um, so let's just take a step back. So. Uh, when we replaced that old rickety bridge, do you remember in the good old days when you had a stoplight and you had to get through there? Uh, we worked a lot with the community, and I know I did at the time as well, and, and uh, certainly Ardell is one of the people that I've worked with and, and, and what's happened to her and some of the houses that are on that, on that ring road now. Um, and at the time, uh, we lowered the road, actually. It, uh, we, we actually lowered it, and I think it cost about 7 or $8 million more to lower it so that we could put a decent berm in there. The game changed, actually. The whole game changed with the Transportation Utility Corridor and with the province and the Sutina um, signing the deal to, bring the, to build the ring road. So the city lost a lot of its jurisdiction when it came to the amount of take that the province had in order to put that new ring road in there. And so there is a lot of dissatisfaction with the sound barrier that's there, um, what the province has put in, um, there's dissatisfaction, and I understand there's lawsuits that are going on with the loss of property value that's happened to these people, the, last, the lack of consultation mark that's happened. I cycle through there and run through there all the time. I believe every word they're saying with this. This, this really is really, really unfortunate. Um, so um, with the dog parks though, um, the, now that the TUC is not fully needed, um, I, we are working with getting 40 acres to have an off-leash dog park there um, so that we can do that uh, and, and have that for, for us in this area. The other thing is, is that when you go along 37th Street heading into uh, beyond Cedarbury and into Woodbine, there's that whole strip there that we want to fence off and have a long linear dog park in that whole area because there aren't enough dog parks 
people always want more dog parks and so do I, even though my Shih Tzus hardly get out of, out of the yard. Yes. Yeah. We're a city of dogs. I think I'll just, just because I don't, I'm not sure that you addressed it there. There was a feeling of the, the residents of this community reached out to you. How, how would you respond to the fact they're saying there wasn't enough communication from your office to residents here in Woodbine on this so, issue? So uh, absolutely. I can always do better. Uh, I would be, I would be the first to admit that when you're dealing with these uh, joint, um, um, development, mega development projects. Um, um, and there's a lot of controversy and you're organizing meetings um, and people expect you to be there. And, uh, you know, for those people that feel that I came up short, I apologize. I can do better. I always can do better uh, when it comes to responding to, you know, the the population base of this ward, which is ever growing um, and, and so on. So, um, um, I, I'm proud of the staff that we have though. Um, I think they too always try to do their best, but if we came up short, we're sorry. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to read these questions verbatim. Um, we have seen most candidates participate within the community, uh, come to our doors and be widely visible. Why not you? We are out there. We're out there door knocking and, uh, um, so, um, we haven't been doing this full time because we've been in a bit of a crisis here for the last 19 months. Uh, but we have been holding a lot of virtual town hall meetings. I certainly respect the fact that there is a pandemic and that we've had to respect, um, health orders and distancing and all of the other things that go with that. Um, and so, um, we, we've loosened up a bit within the last three or four months uh, to be out doing a lot of door knocking and whatnot. And, uh, and we're still doing that actually. And so uh, uh, people can go to vote Diane. Uh, we have virtual town hall meetings and, uh, and, and I'm proud to serve the residents actually of Woodbine and Woodlands and do everything I can to help them when they need my help. All right. Uh, final question here. Uh, while I live right on 130th Avenue in Woodbine, I don't care about the ring road. It's a done deal. And aside from traffic noise, I have adjusted to the impacts thus far. And as city councillors, at this point, there appears to be little that can be done. I am more concerned about citizens having a nonpartisan voice in City Hall. Just get your response on that. Oh, I'd love to talk about that one. <laughs> Uh, because that, that, if, if I if I can just direct you to give color to that question, I mean clearly there's a lot of log jams in City Hall. Although it's a nonpartisan, technically it seems like partisanship does come up. I think we as residents in Woodbine are just looking for the best representation possible um, that will address our issues, whether it's red, orange, blue, green, purple. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I understand that clearly, Mark. I remember 21 years ago, um, you know, I had worked really hard provincially with the uh, Progressive Conservatives of Alberta. Uh, and as I mentioned, when we first started out here federally uh, with prime ministers and so on and so forth, and I was pretty partisan. Uh, in fact, I ran as a conservative when Ron Stevens stepped down and was beat by the Wild Rose. Um, and I was quite partisan when I got on council, really. I thought it was left, right, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, I can tell you that you're one vote when you get there, and you really have to know how to work with other people, and you've really got to set your partisanship aside um, because it's a nonpartisan body. For, so for those that are coming in, um, you know, that have a highly charged partisan perspective of things, Partisan meaning uh, Wild Rose, UCP, uh, or Liberal, um, or, or NDP, or any of these others, um, it's probably not the best political platform for you uh, because uh, you really need to set those things aside. Because when it comes to uh, green spaces and pathways and, and, and talking about policing and your garbage and, and the response of firefighters and all those things, those things are nonpartisan. And mm -hmm. so um, uh, when, when the skirmishes have happened at City Hall and, and all, all your listeners uh, know uh, when those skirmishes, skirmishes have happened, it's been pretty well based on partisanship. 
and it's, mm. it's dysfunctional. And I remember uh, a philanthropist by the name of Art Smith, who was well known in Calgary, and he came over to see David and I uh, one time, and he said, you know, Diane, when we send you to City Hall, we expect you to get along, and we expect you to work hard for the people of your ward, and not be uh, politically partisan motivated. So you're, mm. you're down there to do the job and to get things done. And, and I hope when people look at my track record, they can go to counselordiane.ca, which is my counselor website, that uh, you can see the track record that I, that I have. And, uh, and we're in some really, really challenging times right now. Um, we've got a lot of issues to deal with to turn this economy around and to get Calgary to come back. We've got issues with racism and discrimination and inequities in this city that we need to deal with. And I've had experience in dealing with these things, both as a volunteer, as a registered nurse, and as an elected official. Hmm. Well, let's uh, let's close it off here, Diane. Give us your, your 30 second elevator pitch, as I've been telling the other candidates, <laughs> why should we vote for you on October 18th? Well, um, I, I would like to say, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, for electing me for the number of times that you have uh, and also for the two times that I've been acclaimed by the residents of Ward 13. Um, this, uh, my, 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 my campaign platform is pretty distinctive. It's well-researched. I've consulted with a lot of people. Um, on October 19th, I'll be sitting down with administration uh, and the chief of police and the fire, uh, the fire chief uh, to talk about why the, uh, the citizens elected me, and I hope they will. Um, there is a lot at stake here. Uh, the distinction is we need to recover from this uh, pandemic. We need to reinvest, and we need to rebuild, and we need to get this city back on track, and we don't have a lot of time to waste in order to do it. Thank you, Diane. I, one more time, give us the website where people can find out more about your platform. Thank you. So um, I'm Councillor Diane Marie collier -Cart, um, and uh, my website is votediane.ca, and please call me at 403-993-DICU. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Diane.